Welcome to Wine for Normal People, the podcast for people who like wine, but not the snobbery that goes with it. I'm your host, Elizabeth Schneider, author of the Wine for Normal People book and certified wine dork. And I'm MC Ice, just a wine-loving normal person. This podcast is sponsored by our amazing exclusive sponsor, Wine Access. Go to wineaccess.com slash normal. Sign up for the Wine Access Wine for Normal People Wine Club. The price has just dropped 150 bucks for six bottles that I select. 10% off your first order, wineaccess.com slash normal. Now let's get to the show. It's very exciting to have MC Ice back in studio. Yeah, I'm sure everyone's been clamoring for that. I think that they miss some of the humor. I've had a lot of yeah, but, amazing guests. Right, and look at how much knowledge they've imparted on the listeners. I hope that people have been interested in some of the guests we've had. We had Drew Perry on from Good Harbor and Aurora from Michigan. Those wines were awesome. We were really surprised by yeah, those. They yeah, they were great. And then some follow-up from my trip to Italy. Some of the insights I got from the producers were completely eye-opening, and I hope that I was able to convey that. And now we are back with MC Ice. We will provide you with some... More dumb questions? Some levity okay. also, All which right. is nice. It doesn't have to always be a serious one, right? Right. And I feel like this one is a great entree back into some of our more educational episodes, because this is a firsthand account of our awesome trip to the country of Portugal. And we did not cover the entire country of Portugal. And we were not there for wine specifically, although it was interwoven through everything that we did, did. basically. <laughs> like so, everything else. <laughs> like everything else. No, if we go to the beach, we're not going to be, <laughs> the we'll beach be here drinking. In the US. Yes. Right. We're not right. going to be drinking the native wines. But. We have some intel to share, and we definitely had some blunders and some successes. I would say I was pretty surprised by our success rate, though. You know, it's times like this that really make me question your choice for educational medium. Why? Well, because we should be displaying a slideshow of (laughs) pictures with lengthy descriptions and anecdotes. So can I just say... I'm sorry to sidetrack already, but we are back. So here you go. This is a sidetrack. When I was younger, my dad went on sabbatical because he was a professor forever. And he went on sabbatical twice to India, once for a full academic year. Wow. And once for a semester. And he came back and he and my stepmother sat my sister and I down and proceeded to do one of those slideshows yes, with the round with the, thing. With the carousel, oh yes. Oh, my God. And meanwhile, they had two carousels. So while we were finishing the other one, she was busy loading up the next one. We could not have been more bored. This is such an 80s moment. It, it was like probably 1981, 1982. All we needed was, you know, when you used to run the slideshow in school and it would go, because like, mm-hmm. it had yes. a cassette yes. next to it. Yes. I am so sorry if you're any younger than us, you would ha- not have any of this information. Anyone under 100 has no <laughs> idea what we're talking about. It was a different world back then. Yes, Let's just. It was. But we had some really, really spectacular wines. So let's just lay out where we were in Portugal. And then we will talk about some of the wines that we encountered whilst there. First of all, the itinerary here is that we spent two weeks in the Algarve. The Algarve is not known as a major wine region except for what we would call tourist wine, although they are trying to improve what they have. The Algarve is known for its very steep cliffs, these sandstone, limestone cliffs that drop right into the ocean. It's gorgeous. It is breathtakingly beautiful. It is horribly crowded also. Lots of Europeans vacation there. And actually, there were a good amount of Mar- Americans, but mostly Not it's, a, yeah, Americans. It it's was Portuguese. A of, right. And, and a lot and, of Brits. And lots of Brits and Germans. And there were some Italians there even, too. True. So, yeah, it, you got plenty of experience Practicing your Italian. I spoke more Italian in Portugal than I did in Italy. That's hilarious. Yes, actually. But you did great, though. I did okay. And to be able to flip back and forth the way you did among all the languages was pretty impressive. But let's be clear. I thought, really mistakenly, we learned this like within two days, I thought that because I am conversational in Spanish, 
that Let's I could not go be there. Dumb Americans. And, I could speak right? Spanish and it would be accepted. And I know if you're Portuguese and listening to this, I'm sorry to say this, that I was this ignorant. Portuguese really do not like the nope. Spanish. <laughs> you were like, and, no, just um, please just speak English. They would just way, English, yes. way, way prefer to speak English. Even if you're from Spain, they yeah. prefer to speak English mm-hmm. with you rather than Spanish. Mm-hmm. So there is definitely a, a grudge match. There's still a little uh, competition there. Yeah. yeah. So don't speak Spanish if you go there. Just if you speak English, it's fine. that's it. It's yes, fine. Yes. They're very, very oh, nice. Oh my God. The, the people, people are so nice. And it's I will ridiculous. say that the Algarve, we were in Lagos, which is a smaller town in Algarve. Porta Mal and right. Faro are Towards quite the bigger. Western west, side right. of the Algarve. Yeah. So west that we were able to go to the end of the earth. Remember? That's right. Yep. That's right. There's an area where they the used to... The southwesternist... Yes, this corner. right. And what's so crazy about it is we were standing out there so windy and really all you see is horizon. Oh my These God. people who decided to go, it's kind yeah, of... Yeah, I'm going to sail into that. Off not of these knowing. cliffs, like yeah, yeah. And, and but just it not knowing sick. what was farther out takes a lot of courage. So yeah. hats off to them. We did the Algarve, mm-hmm. and then we spent a week in Kashkaish, which, which is, is the Portuguese Riviera, right near Lisbon. Right, it, it was lovely, very beautiful. We did not spend a ton of time in Lisbon. So I will say that's obviously a bucket list thing. We spent one day in Lisbon. One day we were going to go back. Yep. There's a little train strike that yes, prevented us from European. going back. Yep. We were not able to spend two of our seven days there as the plan was. But in any Guess case... Guess what? We'll be back. We will be back. We did spend one day. Unfortunately, MCS had to work, so he could not go in Evora, which is in the Alentejano or Ta- Alenteju wine region. And I have lots of really great information. We are drinking a delicious wine from that, that region. That is delicious. Yes. And what it is, is it? It is the Moreto grape. It is one of the only 100% Morettos in all of Portugal. And this is from a producer who is reviving all of these old native it's grapes. Delicious. It's an unbelievable and really story. really unusual. Yes. We will share that. But before we do that, I owe the patrons an enormous thanks. And I am so sorry that we have not had the shout outs. So I want to get back to that. We will not be able to do everything, but I'm going to get through some of them. And I do want to just thank everybody. Patreon.com forward slash wine for normal people without Patreon and wine access. We wouldn't be around. And the patrons got tons of exclusive content when I was in Portugal. Again, if you're wondering like why maybe I don't post that much on social media, I will be leaving Twitter though, or X or whatever it is. So (laughs) if you do follow me there, you're going to have to follow me somewhere else. That's going to happen this week. I've decided that that's not a great place for me to be. Right. You get over to OnlyFans. Instagram. Good call. <laughs> <laughs> Instagram, Wine for Normal People, and Facebook. And then, of course, Patreon, which is where I really live. I do need to thank the patrons because even just a little bit of contribution every month really, really helps us. No joke. John M., Chris M., J., Seth G., Katie K., Amanda C., Dan G., Francesca M., Adrian K, Ann W, Cassidy S, Joe W, Marco M, Mirage K, Anna N, Abby A, Rebecca S, David W, Scott K, Jason D, Nina N, Patrick C, Monica U, Kathy A, Simon B, GGG, and Tim L. And we will get everybody else the next time. And thank you all so much for being thoughtful and understanding how much work goes into the podcast. I've been hearing so many people lately be so grateful. I have to give it. Yeah. Incredibly. I have to give it. Teresa Kay. I asked her if I could use her testimonial on the site. Because you do create a tremendous amount of value on Patreon and the podcast. So kudos to you. All right. So it's a lot of effort. It's not nothing. It's not nothing. Let's talk about Algarve first. So we show up in Algarve, and the first thing that we do is go to a grocery store because we need food for our family. Per the podcast last week or two weeks ago, Ava Martinelli said, do not buy wines in the grocery store. So already we made a horrible error. But But 
There were some producers that I did know that were good and high quality in the continent. They were de- that's right. They were decent and such good values. I couldn't believe the pricing on some of them. They were. Had I to do it again, yes. I would have bought a couple of bottles there right. and then sought out a store to find better stuff or gone to the well, wine bar. We found bar some and, yeah. wine bars that were right. very, very good. Right, which yes. we will get to. We bought a bunch of wines from Algarve because we can't get those in the when U.S., in right? Marques dos Valles, the Selecta, the Bronco, which is the white, and the Rosso. And then we tried a bunch of regular wines from Alentejano, which is the Vino Regional, the larger area right. in which Alenteju is part of. We tried a bunch, and I will just say over and over and over again, any Algarve wine we had was the definition of meh, except the rosé, which was actually undrinkable. We had it at a restaurant and we could almost not drink it. It was that bad. Um, oh, you mean when our daughter had to have Pizza Hut? And then said it tasted different and didn't yes, want it because right. all she did the entire time was complain. But she is nine. So, you know, right. our biggest grocery store winners were white, definitely not reds. There are many reds we had to pour down the sink. They just were not good. Our success actually came with wines from the Peninsula de Setubal, or as they say, their Stubel. Stubel, which is just southeast of, of Lisbon. Lisbon. Yes. Right. Those whites were from the grape, the same grape, Maria Gomez or Fernal Peresh. And these are excellent wines. So if you do find yourself in Portugal, you probably will not see those wines here on the shelves as much. But if you happen to go there, the whites were successful, thank God, because it was so freaking hot the first week we were there. We had to buy fans right. for the we rental did. because That's they right. had no air conditioning, <laughs> which they don't need the second week we realized right. you know, we why don't, they, they don't, don't have but, it. But yeah, and they, we had a pool. And yeah, it, was it still so wasn't hot. enough. Yeah. So Stubel or Setubal, Peninsula de Stubel, that's the DOC. But Algarve was just not that great. And a lot of people were asking me, are you going to go wine tasting in Algarve? Because it's a wine region. We looked into it. And it expensive. the cheapest one was 42 euro a person. Right. These are not really high quality wines. So it made me very uncomfortable to think that we would spend 84 euro for a lackluster experience that did not sit right with me. So instead, what we decided to do was once our grocery store (laughs) wines and actually ordering some bottles in restaurants that were just, we went on my favorite resource. I know not all of you use it, but I do. TripAdvisor. TripAdvisor, when I don't know where I'm going, provides the best information. But... I will say that like any review site, it's always a balance. But if it's got above a four star, 4.2 star rating, it's at that point that you start to drill down. Is well, it that somebody had a bad why right. they ranked it the way they did? Yes. Right. But one that had almost all five stars was a wine bar in Lagos called Mosto. And if you find yourself in Lagos, Portugal, in the Algarve, you must go there. It is a great had, vibe. The food was great. The melted manchego, oh my, oh my which God, wasn't was, hot. I, I was don't thinking know about that. Somebody that was, asked me about like, it was delicious. how did they like melt the manchego and then keep it soft? Yeah, it's not like queso at the Mexican restaurant. Not you that know? soft, but right. it was somewhere between that and but harder it was like, cheese, kind of like creamy. Like if you melted brie a little bit, it was, it was like sort of that the texture, texture of brie. Yeah. And it was cold. Right. But it was delicious. Oh, so we got to give a shout out to Sophia, right? Sophia, right. Yeah. She was fantastic. So knowledgeable, so welcoming. Helpful. They have a real regular crowd there also, yes, people who live there, which I think is a good sign. We started out with the Nosa Calcario, mm-hmm. which is a Bical. That's a grape. They usually make sparkling wine out of Bical because it's high acidity. Philippa Pata. And William Wouters, who is her husband, Mm -hmm. she's the winemaker. They are in the Bajrada or Bayrada DOC. And that is in the middle of the country. For a long time, it wasn't thought of very well because the red is the Baga grape, which can be harsh, but they're learning how to deal with that too. Her father, Luis Pata, has made a name for himself in Bayrada as well. We actually had a number of wines from Luis Pata. We bought them in Lisbon and nobody really liked them except me. But the Felipe Pata wine 
was an amazing wine, great acidity, mm -hmm. earthiness. It did taste like minerals, just fantastic with the melted manchego. Yeah, it was, was it was really awesome. Good. That was a great pairing. Yeah, and she also gave us a Doro, a winery I'd never heard of, Quinta da Javali. It was the Clodo Santo Red 2020. It was a really light style Doro. It was almost like a Pinot, Pinot Noir. Right. I did not like it alone, but they served it with these mushrooms that were so savory. So it probably would be good with steak. Remember, on top I had it with the steak tapas as well. That was really good. Yeah. It was a good pairing. And then she also sent us home with probably before we went to Alenteju, the best wine that we had the entire trip, which was called Pop. P-A-P-E. It oh, was from yeah, the Dow. Right. And it was insanely good. It tasted a little bit like a barnyard, but the fruit flavors, the raspberry notes, everything, it was so terroir driven. It was a 2018 pop, P-A-P-E. Like I said, mm -hmm. just an outstanding one. I'm not sure who the Quinta is that makes that wine. It just says in very big letters, but we will be seeking that out again because it was spectacular. And the other thing that I want to give a shout out to is, although if you listened to the debrief that I did on the Vino Verde trip, you know that I actually had the worst experience ever on that trip because I went with a journalist mm -hmm. who called me a Karen and made me feel like I was 150 years old and were absolutely terrible people, but... Well, they just weren't interested in... They were mean girls. There's no place for that in a professional environment, but it happened. But I came away from that so scarred by the social experience that I was like, ugh. And I didn't realize how much I really learned because when we were in the grocery stores or in mm -hmm. the restaurants, I knew who the best producers of Vino Verde were. I knew that Vino Verde was way more than the bubbles and the cheap stuff. And so we were able to Yeah, when the waiters would ask you about or suggest Vina Verde, you knew exactly what they were talking about. I knew exactly who the top producers were. That's what were, I mean, yes. Having visited them and really listened and got a lot out of that. So that's the silver lining on that. Although I thought all was lost on that first trip. Some people just want a free trip. Others want to go for the education. Yes. So... The other thing that we did once we got our sea legs is not only did we go to Mosto, we went to a couple of great restaurants. Barbosa was Barbosa, one of them yeah, was in great. Lagos. And we drank some Encruzado. And this wine is available in the U.S., the Casa de Moraz Encruzado. It was spectacular. We had a lot of vegetarian food, but it went really well mm -hmm. with burrata, with pesto for some reason. The Solero Alvarino was also really awesome from Vino Verde. Didn't so, I have the Madeira? You had a dry Madeira. Mm -hmm. But we had it with the cheesecake. It was heaven. It was um, it just all melted in your mouth. Oh I am gosh. not a huge cheesecake fan. No, I'm not either. But the waiter recommended it, and he was awesome. We he could not say great. no to him. Yes. He recommended the cheesecake. He said it was their thing. So we ordered it with the Madeira. It was awesome. We had port that night, too, that was mm -hmm. quite good. Tawny port. Right. That and was good. Yeah, that was really good. We drank a decent amount of port, but there's only so much port that I can drink personally. It's very high in calories. It's also very heavy. Mm. Even the dry styles, it's a little much. We had it with dessert, though. We did drink port with dessert. And you know what was amazing is that the Portuguese liked talking about their wines, and they seemed really proud of it. It seems like they're becoming more comfortable as a high-end producer. Sadly, you missed the best example of that when we were in Alentejo, and we went to two producers who were both very high-end. One charges like $300 a bottle for their wine. So... The last Lagos one is a place called Taninos, and it was a very long meal. They had a lot of wine, not as good as Mosto, didn't even touch Mosto in terms of the wine selection. But we did have one really outstanding wine there from Quinta dos Carvales, which is from So Grape. If you have ever listened to any of the podcasts on the overview of Portugal in general, what you'll know is that Portugal, much like Spain, was under the power of a dictatorship for decades and decades and decades. Now, Salazar. Salazar was the dictator. So we learned that Salazar was actually really good for limited education. Remember, we talked to our tour driver guy in Lisbon about how he didn't want people to be too educated, but provided some education. Great job of providing a broad 
base of education, but not too Very deep. deep yes. Yeah, didn't want people to be too professional. But in terms of wine, there were a lot of small growers. They were struggling. And so he made them organize in cooperatives. And as a result, there wasn't a whole lot of focus on quality. There was a focus on a lot of volume. So we visited the oldest co op. We did. And some of these co ops are very good quality, but the biggest one was called So Grape. And they were running most of the wine. They made Matuas. So they were responsible for all of this big, big wine. Who knew that out of that, they would form one of the most prestigious domains in the Dow, which is Quinta dos Carvales. So we had the Bronco White, Bronco Especial, or Especial Dow. It was a number of vintages mushed together. It was mostly Encruzado, which is the white of the Dow. Like and it champagne was, style? Yes, it was right, non-vintage. Yes. When we had that wine, we knew that it was something it really was special. Unique, yes. It was something very different. It had oak, but it wasn't over it the was top. Very subtle and great flavors, but then also really unique texture. Yeah, it. it had a certain weight to it, yep. certainly. And we had started out with a white Dora, which was nice and minerally. I expected a little bit more from it. It was a Reserva. But then when we got this wine, they had recommended it. It definitely was the best wine of the night. As we said at the beginning of the show, don't forget, patreon.com slash wine for normal people did a live hangout from Portugal. There were constant posts for folks who were patrons. Check out Patreon today, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com slash wine for normal people. We rely on Patreon to keep going. And so we hope that you'll consider joining the community. A great way to connect with other wine lovers, to have a really fun time with wine and to also support the podcast. And another way to support the podcast is to support our awesome exclusive sponsor, Wine Access, wineaccess dot com slash normal is how you will gain access to the next shipment of the Wine for Normal People Wine Club, which is, as I'm jokingly calling it, Serge DeRay all day. If you're a regular podcast listener, you know Serge is my go-to for on the ground information about what is going on in these regions, because Serge is an importer of family owned French wines from all over France. And he only works with high quality producers. These might be unknown or small properties. They are fantastic. And this is testament to wine access that when I ask them, hey, look, we've got an access problem with Serge's wine. So many people want to try them after hearing him and listening to him, but it's so hard to get them because he's only distributed in New York and New England. Can you help us? And the answer was, Absolutely. Here we are with a shipment of six bottles, $150. Wineaccess.com slash normal. Get 10% off your first order. Get on it today. Awesome wines, awesome prices, awesome customer service, and fantastic people. Support them as they support this show and get some great wines in the process. And also don't forget wineforNormalPeople.com slash classes. Yes, I finally posted the new ones up. Chardonnay around the world, which I've never taught before. I'll explain when you take the class. Also, interesting reds. Wines of Italy, if you've never taken that class. And Wines of Loire, which I haven't taught in a while. WineforNormalPeople.com slash classes. Now let's get back to the show, which is something I hope that you can use if you decide to go to Portugal or if you decide to do armchair travel and get on and Google some of these wines that we had that were so absolutely spectacular. So I actually think that versus Kashkaish, Lagos had better food and better wine. I, I think the wine list in Kashkaish so they, were not good. No, even though the native wine in the Algarve or Lagos was... Okay. Don it was pretty donkey. The selection of what was available in the grocery stores, in the wine shops, and the restaurants was top notch. Even in the grocery store, there was one wine I'd been looking to try their old Amphora style wine, which is called, I know I'm not saying this right, but Tala, T A L H A. Mm -hmm. 
And it was like a dime a dozen. You could find them pretty yeah. easily. But there was this one, Herdade do Rochim, and it was Amphora. It was from Alentejo. Really a great wine. It had Moretto in it, which we are drinking now. It was a majority of Moretto. Tinta Grossa, Trincadera Aragonese, which is Tempranillo. But interesting wines, quite good. Yep. And we had great Italian food down there. We had really great Indian food in Algarve. When we came up to Kashkaish, there was good food, but the wine list took a precipitous dive. There was not the kind of selection that was in Lagos. No, that's right. We were not even able to find, and again, we were only there for a week, and we were with my sister and her kids, and so that we really had extended multiplied family it. For yeah, that portion of the yeah. Trip. So that limited us. But my general impression was that for a place that's the Portuguese Riviera, they should probably step up the wine list a little bit. There wasn't a whole lot. And when we went to Lisbon for the day, I shopped for a bunch of wines. That's where I got those Luis Pata wines. And nobody was impressed with any of those wines Hmm. either, including me. Like I said, I like the Pata wines, but a lot of those wines were famous producers. And the only ones that anyone liked were things from Vino Verde. Even the Dora wines Mm -hmm. just did not make the grade. Some of those wines went down the drain also. That's true. True. I'll address the Alentejo. On a day, unfortunately, that, that <laughs> MCI that was, uh, it was... had to work. I went with my sister and the kids and our tour guide who looked a whole lot like Gru from Minions. I'm so now, sorry. No, I had, I met him through a recommendation of somebody else in Raleigh that had gone to Lisbon. And so I used him last year when I visited Lisbon. And he's great. Oh, my God. He's so great. He is but amazing. And if you want you his name, definitely if, just hit him. me up on Patreon and I will give you his info. But I but will tell you right now. We got to give your sister props for this, right? It was Wyatt. No. Yes. Wyatt yes, made the he call? Was not, he was the one who said, I thought you it was your sister. We rem- no. No. Oh it was our 13-year-old, 13-year-old nephew. nephew. Who said, he reminds me of Gru from Minions. And if anybody knows who that is, he had the same laugh. He's a little bit hunched over like that. It he has the like same sense of humor. Snarky sense of humor, oh, same it was accent. So bad. It was, it was hilarious. hilarious. But more hair. A lot more hair. Yeah, and but, better looking, I would yes, say. Yes, but, but we oh went to God. Evera. I cannot recommend it highly enough. It was an amazing town. It was quite hot when we went, but the main square was beautiful. That's where they had the Roman ruins that you saw, right? We ate in a restaurant. I cannot remember the name. I had done some research ahead of time. Actually, Gru, we'll just call him Gru, he had recommended this restaurant because it's very traditional Portuguese food. And it was kind of fancy. And the kids, our older daughter is a very picky eater. So Mm -hmm. I was feeding her peanut butter crackers under the table right. and she wasn't sitting under the table right. but I was passing them to her. Oh, you let her Remember? sit above the table this time. Yeah, it's oh, not good. nice to me. Nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and I let her drink yeah, some water. But actually, again, the younger progress. one was the one that was the problem. So <laughs> I'd researched wines that I wanted to try in the Alentejo because again, you can't visit all the wineries, but if you can... Look some stuff up before you go to the wine region and find some nice wines that you think you might be able to order. We ordered a wine, Quinta do Jambugero. It's Z-A-M-B-U-J-E-I-R-O. It was quite pricey in the restaurant. It was so freaking tasty, though. Really? But it was 16 and a half percent alcohol. Oh my God. Did it, it taste like 16 and a half percent? It didn't. It didn't. So it was Alicante Boucher, which is a grape that I really love. And I love that they grow so much of it in Alentejo or, or the Vino Regional Alentejano. It is a French grape and it does well in heat. And this area is hot. They had Tariga Nacional and Petit Verdot. 24 months in new French oak. Delicious, delicious wine. I gave the server two choices of the wines. Mm -hmm. He recommended this, and it was delicious. It was very silky, very full, very rich. Obviously, at 16.5%. Did you pair it with any food? I did not have appropriate food to pair it with because I ordered fish. Oh. But my sister did have it with steak. Steak, okay. And she said it was really good. Although, I will say that she liked it so much 
that she just wanted to drink it by itself. It really? disappeared pretty quickly. When he first poured it, he tried to pour the glass. I said, please let it decant because yeah. it, it's a kind of place that's pretty fancy. So they take it away yeah. to decant. But when he poured it at the beginning, I said, just wait until the mains come because it probably could have used three or four hours of decanting. Wow. But it was tasty. I'm so glad that we got a chance to try it because it is a very exclusive wine of the region hmm. and something that you may be able to get it, but it's hard to find. So then... We went Sounds to, like it was amazing. Hmm. <laughs> we went to two wineries. One, we didn't really go to the winery. We went to the tasting room, Cartuja. Cartuja is in an old monastery, and I wish cool. I had planned ahead a little bit more. They were booked up. We couldn't go to the property itself. So instead, they have a tasting room in town in Evora. Evora is one of the sub-regions of Alentejo. There's Borba and Evora and Porto Alegre, and there's a bunch of others that I can't remember right now. But Wait, Cartusia... So how far outside of, say, Lisbon is It was this? an hour and 40 minutes. Okay. So Cartusia, the wine bar was quite busy, but we were able to get a spout at the bar pretty easily. And we tried these wines. Now, here's the interesting thing. They have several different lines of wines. And the guy said, what do you want to try? And I said, I would like to try your best and most representative wine. And he said, okay, here are two wines. And these were their reservas. This is what I will tell you. The white tasted like Napa Chardonnay. It had zero sense of place. What? I could not finish it. What? And Gru yeah. said he had always wanted to try it. You so after, it yeah, I mean, we're lucky nobody got COVID because we passed this one oh glass God. around right. to everybody. So my sister did not care for it. I did not care for it. And Gru really did not like really? it. Really? And then the red was also pretty heavily oaked, high alcohol. And I said, do you have anything else that maybe would be a little different. Are they trying to cater to tourists or something? So apparently they got really high scores on these wines. and Thanks, Robert Parker. Right. No, I mean, Robert Parker's, you know, his influence is long gone, but this is, I guess it's still still here. Because because this was a ridiculous showing. So he then poured me their everyday wine. Yes. It was like six euro. (laughs) It had a sense of solidity. And yet at the same time, it was smooth in the mouth. This is the white. It was so much better. The red had a lot of structure, tannin. It wasn't over the top. They did not oak age it. The wines for six euro were better by leaps and Did you and tell bounce. him that? I did. And it, what he what said. What was his response? He laughed and he said, well, that's very interesting that you say that uh-huh. because they had a wine. It was called EA. It was their basic wine. I forgot what his name is, but he said, what we can get the prices for in the international market are wines that taste like this. But I agree with you. The wines that are better and more representative are the ones that we're charging six euro for. And I think this is a major, major lesson to understand in Portugal. As they are trying to move up scale, I think that some of the best wines are getting lost in translation. I guess what I'm saying is, if you go to one of these wineries, do not poo-poo the bottom tier. Right. Because I will tell you that sometimes that's the best wine. Yeah. I remember in Vino Verde finding that also. Mm -hmm. So as they're finding their way as to what will work, and I don't want to compare Spain and Portugal, but Spain is ahead on this. Spain is able to say, you know what? Here's our Mencia. We're putting it forward. I don't care whether you've never heard about it. This is it. Here you go. Have a nice day. The Rosado for the Rosé class, we've already tasted. It is from Lyon. It's not even a specific sub-region. And it is one of the most amazing rosés I've ever Mm -hmm. had. And it's from a grape that if I said it, you would have no idea what it was because it's just a native grape. They don't care. They're going to put it out there. So Portugal, the next winery that I'll talk about, and then the last one when we talk about Colares, we will talk about this, about this confidence. So The next place that we went was called Fita Preta Vinos, which is this ultra modern winery that's attached to a castle. I need to give a shout out to Veronica, the hospitality manager. The winemaker is this guy named Antonio Masanita. And Wait, is she the one that you said had beautiful eyes or something? No, I didn't say she had beautiful eyes. I said she and I had the same eyes. I have same these very thing. strange, oh, very nice. Yes. These strange colored eyes. It's probably hard to see them on the video, but in person, mm-hmm. they are an unusual color. And I looked at her and I was like looking in the mirror. I've just never seen anybody with the exact right. same eye color. But in any case, 
we went to Fita Preta. My sister and I were in absolute heaven. We started out with an old vine, a rinto from the Azores that was aged on the leaves. It was unbelievable. Then they did amphora-based wine. I bought almost a bottle of every single thing we tried. We would have tried everything. And and for oh, that's why the suitcases were so heavy. A dry Madeira wine, first non-fortified Madeira wine sold outside of Madeira. Wow. And it looks like a bottle of Madeira. Fantastic. And then she gave us their signature series. There's a wine called a Branco de Tala. Antonio Massanita is really into and for it and reviving these ancient grapes. Hmm. So that wine was crazy. It was like pinion and eucalyptus, saltiness in the amphora. There was an Alicante Branco. Alicante Branco is a grape I've never heard of before. Okay, it what is smelled that? like tahini. It tasted like tahini. basil. It was so good. And then there were some other old vine wines. But there's the wine that we're drinking now, which is 100% Moreto. What is it? Because it is delicious. It is the Moreto grape. And they are reviving this. Fita Preta is distributed in the U.S., but not widely enough. These wines are spectacular. One after the other after the other were so good. I felt so lucky. And again, this was really based on Did, a wait, triangulation. This is what I missed? Yes. This is based on a triangulation of TripAdvisor and some of the wine trade and what they have said was really special and interesting. I could not have been happier. I could not recommend more highly the hospitality experience, the food that they served, how absolutely welcoming they were. Veronica stayed late for us. Fita Preta is amazing. It is worth the hour and a half or hour and 40 minute drive to go to Evera itself, which is smashingly beautiful with Roman ruins, preserved old Roman temple. It is so gorgeous, so pristine, so clean. You can go to Cartuja and you can go to some of the other winers, but do not miss Fita Wait, point of clarification. Was it an hour and, a, hour and 40 minutes for you when you went? An hour and 40 minutes driving? Yes. yes. Okay, yes. so actually, because we were in Kashkaish, if you're going from Lisbon... It'd it's be a little, probably closer to an hour-ish, right? Yes, it'd probably okay, be a little so bit closer. Okay, so that's like really reasonable. On the tourist level, on the food level, we got all of our souvenirs there because they were so cute. I loved it. The last place that we'll talk about before we close this down is Kolarish. Kolarish was a really special trip. So I visited there last year, but they weren't open. I knew what it was. I tried lots of rake pictures and everything, but to get in and see it and hear the stories behind it was really amazing. I knew about Kolarish. It had been hedged out by suburban growth. The main red is Ramisco. The main white is Malvasia. These are wines grown in sandy soils that were never touched by phylloxera. So they are old vines mm -hmm. and they're grown in very, very windy places. So what did the vines look like? They are trained very low to the ground. They are little bush vines and they look like nothing, but they I mean, are on like the pure sand. like squash grow or something. You it know? did it's... look a little like squash because they're vines yeah. and they are trained low because the wind is so whipping out there. You have no idea how cold it is. It was freezing when we were out yeah. there. And you drive by these vineyards, they are wind whipped. The Colarish Appalachian, the DOC, is not very large. But their full production fits in one of those huge wooden vats. I mean, it's... Yeah, I mean, the story is amazing. One so year. They used to have a thousand hectares or 2,500 acres in the 1940s. And then they lost ground to fancy beachside housing and Today, they have 22 hectares or 54 acres. Wow. So it seems like the shrinking has stabilized because one of the things that's happened is that around there is this town called Sintra, which is very beautiful. beautiful. I highly recommend that also. It's a UNESCO World Heritage Site. And because of that and because Kolarish is within a protected park, some of the vineyards, the bleeding has stopped, right? Okay. The infringement upon the vineyards has stopped. So hopefully, if they can grow it a little bit, that would be really nice. But you have to have dedicated viticulturists. And part of the problem is that you can't make that much money off of these wines. They don't charge enough. Nobody's paying enough. To plant a vine, a viticulturist has to... When you say to, not charging enough, give me an example. 
A one really good white was like six euro. It's crazy. And the better one was 22 22, euro. Yeah, 22 euro for this precious wine. They have to dig into basically dunes to three meters or 15 feet that are going to anchor into the Mm -hmm. clay soils that live below the sand. And then they push the sand up in a mound and protect it from the wind. And the wind can cause salt burn because it's salty wind. In extreme conditions, it can blow the grapes off. It really requires a lot of skill and you don't make a lot of money. So this is part of the problem for them. But and it's still a co-op. The co-op is the thing that really saved them. They make over 50% of the wine in the region. They give a financial incentive And a market for growers to keep making these grapes. So thank goodness for the co-op, Adega Regional de Mm Colares. We had four wines. There is their Colares DOC, which is the Arene. I think believe that means in Spanish that refers to sand. That's the Colares Bronco. It's 100% Malvasia de Colares. Very salty, very herbal like honey and lemon, and it spends six months in Brazilian mahogany casks. Is that the one that was a little cloudier looking? Yes. Yes. 20 euro for, and they make it in the traditional size, 500 Mm -hmm. milliliters. Why is it in 500 milliliters? That's how they're traditionally sold. Also, they don't have that much wine. They don't have that much, right? So to make it in 750 milliliters, they could sell a lot less. Then they had their basic wine, which was Malvasia plus Fernal Parash and some other local varieties. That was six euro and really, really good. I think the white was a little bit better than the red. The red 2014 was the last time they released their red, the DOC Colarish from the Romisco grape. Oh, I didn't realize that was the last time they released it. Well, I because it's aged. No, it's aged five years mm. in Brazilian mahogany cask. Right. And then a few years in oak barri. That's what was available. This wine was really good. Again, a lot of salinity and spice and stuff like that. It's 23 euro for 500 milliliters. That's going to be a wine that we're going to hold for a little while because it wasn't quite ready. I would say overall, our trip to these regions, these three areas, it's not representative of all of Portugal, but we did try a lot of wines from all over, from Mm -hmm. all of the major wine regions. I don't think we missed any major wine regions in Portugal in trying these wines. And I think ultimately my estimation is this. One, Portuguese wines are grossly underpriced. And part of that is because they're making it for their own market where people earn less and can pay less. Mm -hmm. So there's that. They should probably increase their prices for export. For export, sure. And two, that there are some rare gems in Portugal in certain regions that maybe you've never heard of before or maybe you think of in a certain way. I think Alentejo has this reputation of being very modern. And yes, I did have a wine that was 16.5% alcohol. And that's something that people associate with Alentejo. But there's a lot going on. And if you need any evidence of that, go directly to Fita Preta and see exactly what I'm talking about. Because that is, in my estimation, the future of unknown regions in Mm -hmm. Portugal and the known regions. And that Dow Pop is one of the best wines I have had from Portugal, right? I feel like they're so modest there, though, was the problem, right? I do think that Douro and Dow are valuing themselves much more highly, and that's great. They are charging more because they've always had a market. They understand that, especially for Douro, port production comes out of there. So they know that they can be valuable and they have a more international orientation. What's a shame to me... Is it still under British influence, though, to some extent? We're not getting it. I know, but that's a long story. I know, know, but but could that be a factor? Well, Taylor's and Symington's, Cockburn's, and you think that those are Portuguese names, you would not be correct. And although those people are Portuguese citizens, Mm -hmm. most of them were raised and shipped off to boarding schools in the UK or their family lived part-time in the UK. So yes, there is still squarely a foot in the UK of those companies which are dominated 
by the British. Mm. There is influence and they are making dry wines, but you know what? God love them. God love Dirk Nieport, who is Dutch, I believe, I think originally, has been a huge pioneer for Dow and Doro. Hmm. I'm not crazy about all of the wines, but really very important figure in doing interesting things and pushing out the idea that there is quality to be had. But I guess what I'm saying is there is quality and originality beyond Dow and Doro. It extends to Vino Verde, where you've got to look for varietally labeled wines. You've got to look for Alvarino. You need to look for Aveso. You need to look for Antau Vaz. Mm -hmm. You need to go into Alentejo and look for things you've never heard of before, because that's interesting. Would I recommend Algarve? Probably not. <laughs> but Go Stubel, to visit, because you're going to so, get access to some great wines right, there. Right, and the food. I got yeah, to say, yeah, the Italian yeah. food and the Italians, it's oh totally God, native. It's hilarious. There's also excellent Portuguese food there. I don't mean to say that there isn't, but when you're there for several weeks, it, you want to shake it up a little bit. And the Indian food there, because Indian there food, were yes. several Indian colonies, there's a lot of great Indian food there if you're an Indian food lover, so prepare for that I too. I love the seafood, the, the breads were amazing. Oh, excellent. Oh Excellent. All in all, a really great trip, but I think that we came back with some good intel on wine. I think overall, like I was surprised that the quality. I was somewhat disappointed, but when we struck gold, we really struck gold. I wished that there was more consistency and that mm, I could come out saying that everything is great. That's not the case, but certainly it's yeah, but not the case that, anyway. Where is that the case? Nowhere is everywhere. Northern great. Rhone. Oh, come on, Jesus. Oh, Barolo. Right. Barbara. But we're talking about a whole country here. <laughs> I'm just kidding. You know, they are emerging on the world stage, but if they can stick with their native grapes yeah. and do the push, mm -hmm. there's no stopping them. What we're drinking right now, I mean, hello, Moretto could be the next sensation. You just never know. Or Alicante Branco or any of these ones. You just have to have the right talent and the right stick to itiveness to be able to do this. Well, and I think they've got it. They're so nice and they need to stop being so modest. Well, and it stop trying to cater to other tastes. Go with what works naturally. Did you, you know? hear that, Cartusia? Listen to me. Right. <laughs> Listen right. to MCIs. So that is our Portugal summary. We will be back next week with a dorky regular episode. But we did want to give you a recap because I know lots of people were anxious to hear what we learned on the trip. And so another one of the, this is what I learned on my summer vacation, right. literally. With that, this has been another episode of Wine for Normal People. Thank you so much for listening and we will catch you next time. <laughs>